The next item of business is a debate on motion 17190 in the name of Colin Smith on Scotland's future. Scrap the cut to the air departure tax. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Colin Smith to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, the Scottish Government made a welcome, if overdue, commitment to strengthen our emissions targets. To accept the Committee on Climate Change's recommendation of a target of net zero emissions by 2045. Labour welcomes this decision. A target of net zero emissions has been our position for some time. It's a target that reflects the urgency of the climate emergency we face. But this sense of urgency, these targets are not worth the paper they're written on if they are not backed by the policies needed to deliver them. That's why the SNP's proposal to cut air departure tax was not only the wrong policy when they ditched it on the eve of this debate, it was the wrong policy when they proposed it in their 2016 election <laughs> manifesto. Officer, it's been the wrong policy every single day since as SNP minister after SNP minister queued up to justify that policy and attacked Labour when we questioned it. The SNP amendment today says a cut in air passenger duty is no, not compatible with the more ambitious targets that Scotland wishes to pursue. But, President Officer, it was never compatible. And Labour's long-standing calls to drop the cut has been vindicated by the SNP's U-turn on the issue, a U-turn that should have been made a long time ago because the Scottish Government's own analysis has consistently predicted that a 50% cut in air departure tax would have been bad for the environment, adding over 60,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent to the atmosphere each year. The strategic environmental assessment of the policy raised concerns that a cut to ADT would have driven a model shift away from rail towards short haul flights. Yet only now do the SNP seem to realise that pursuing policies that would actively increase emissions from transport is damaging to the environment. Transport already... John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. He talks about policies. Would the Labour Party be prepared to support the workplace parking levy, which might help? Colin Smith. Yeah. The answer to that question is no. No one believes the proposal. No one believes the proposal for a workplace parking levy from Derek Mackay was anything other than a fig leaf to try to cover up the brutal cuts in council budgets that this council, this government, are pursuing. Now, the problem with the regressive uh, tax, workplace parking levy tax, where a, a company boss will pay. Uh, well, the, uh, the cabinet secretary speaking from a central business. Do you want to make an intervention? Uh, through the chair, everything, please. Cabinet <laughs> Secretary, I'd, I'd like to fulfil my function. Uh, Co Colin, Cabinet Secretary. Colin Smith has just said uh, nobody believes in the Labour Party, apparently, in the workplace parking levy. Does that include everyone in the Labour Party, including those that took the other position at the Labour Party conference? Colin Smith. The Labour Party put our policy to the conference. The SNP, however, didn't put their policy to their conference. <laughs> And I'll tell you why Derek Mackay. I'll tell you why Derek Mackay sneaked the policy through in the budget is because he knows it's a regressive tax where the company boss will pay the same as a company cleaner, where the chief executive of a health board will be exempt, but a carer on the living wage will have to stump up. And the only thing a workplace parking levy will do is ignite a public backlash that will undermine proper changes to the environment that we're going to need in the future. Presumably, that's why we still haven't seen. We still haven't seen the proposals from the Cabinet Secretary for that particular, <laughs> particular tax. Indeed. Signing off, sir. Signing off, sir. Transport already contributes over a third of Scotland's greenhouse gases. It's the single biggest sectorial contributor with emission levels barely any lower than they were in 1990 and actually higher than they were in 2016. Signing off, sir. When it comes to transport and environment, the Scottish Government have been moving in the wrong direction. Airline passenger numbers are higher Excuse me a ever. minute, Mr. There's a wee debate going on in the back benches between the Glasgow MSPs. Uh, show some respect to the person who's actually leading this debate. Mr. Smith, sorry, you make up your time. They're, they're working out how much the, the workplace parking level will be imposed by the SNP. <laughs> When it comes to transport environment, the government are moving in the wrong direction. The alien passenger numbers are higher than ever before, increasing by 40% since 2010 at Scotland's airports. Yet bus usage continues to plummet and active travel rates are stuck at less than 2%. Of all the modes of transport, domestic air travel is the least environmentally friendly, with higher emissions per passenger kilometre than any other mode. In 2016, aviation was responsible for emitting over 2 megatons of CO2, an increase in the previous year and 50% more than levels in 1990. And a cut in ADT would continue to drive those emissions up. But that wouldn't just have been bad for the environment, it would have been bad 
for our public services. A 50% cut would have cost £150 million a year, with the cost of abolishing it altogether likely to be more than double. That's over £300 million of cuts to our public services they simply could not afford. It would also be a tax cut that would have benefited the most well-off, with the richest 10% almost three times more likely to fly in a year than those on the lowest income. In contrast, lower income groups are disproportionately dependent on bus services, walking and cycling. Yet the recent Scottish budget saw spending in those modes of travel frozen, while at the same time the SNP continued to argue for a £150 million cut on ADT. Three times the total support for buses through the Bus Services Operator Grant. President Officer, I recognise the economic and strategic value of aviation, but we need to support aviation in a responsible and sustainable way, and crucially in a way that is in keeping with our broader transport and environmental aims. This means, for example, supporting Glasgow Airport with a direct rail link to cut car usage on the MA. It does not mean pursuing support for airports that increase emissions and drive passengers away from the greener modes of transport, such as cross-border rail. So the long overdue SNP U-turn on air departure tax is welcome. And it's not just the ACE SNP who have changed their position on air departure tax, it seems. The Tory amendment today calls on the SNP to, and I quote, honour the commitment made in the manifesto it stood on in 2016 and introduced a reduction in Scotland's current ADT regime. The problem for the Tories is, by calling the SNP to honour their manifesto, the Tories are dumping their own manifesto commitment. Because the Tory manifesto in 2016 on air passenger duty was very clear. It said, and I quote, We have studied the evidence on air passenger duty alongside the final report of our tax commission and have concluded that we will not support the Scottish Government's proposed 50% cut in APD. That Tory tax commission also stated, and again I quote, The only impact of a reduction on APD would be to boost airline and airport profits. So at the time the world is declaring a climate change, um, unfortunately, I don't think I've got any extra time. Have I? Signed I can let you have it yep. if you okay, wish. Okay, right, yeah. <coughs> Patrick I'm, I'm very, I'm very grateful. Uh, Colin Smith is quite right to point out the way a number of other parties have changed their view. Can, can Mrs. Smith remind us when it is Labour changed its view after having voted for the SNP's motion on this issue back in 2012? Colin I Smith. Could, I can tell Mr Harvey that our manifesto commitment was very clear and we yeah. stick to our manifesto commitment. Yeah. Well, the SNP and the Tories, it seems, are dropping there. So I welcome the change in position from the SNP. At a time the world is declaring a climate emergency, however, the Tories are declaring themselves as climate deniers. The response to, to rise in transport emissions is to call for them to be raised even further. Well, the Tories move in the direction of Donald Trump on climate change. Scotland needs to be do more and more to move faster in the direction of lower emissions. That means not just ditching the cut in air departure tax, but ditching other damaging policies, including the brutal cuts we've seen to local councils by this government. In 2011, council budgets have been slashed by over £1.5 billion. That cut is continuing in this year's budget, devastating local services. And we see that clearly in transport. Bus services across Scotland are being dismantled route by route, often as a direct result of funding pressure on councils, particularly in rural communities where subsidised services are a lifeline for so many of those communities. And likewise, cuts to local authority budgets are impacting on active travel. If we're serious about reducing emissions from cars, the way to achieve that is to put in place the affordable alternatives. And, presiding officer, if transport is the biggest emitter of greenhouse uh, greenhouse gases. Agriculture is not far behind. This is a sector of huge importance to the Scottish economy, particularly in rural and remote areas. But it's also one of the hardest to treat sectors in terms of emissions. The support system, as it stands, does little to encourage much, much less enforce best practice in terms of emissions and sustainability. Yet this government is dragging its heels and redesigning agricultural support to uh, take Just stop a minute, Mr Smith. I'm looking at the motion and I've been quite lax, but your motion is just about abolish air departure tax. We're now, I think, talking about cows and things. So we've moved off. <laughs> we've moved oh. off the topic a wee bit. And anyway, oh, you uh, should be winding up. Please wind I'll, up. I, I'll refrain from, 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 from arguing the link between the two, presiding officer. But <laughs> presiding officer, over the past 200 years, humans have shown we can change the climate, unfortunately, for the worst. We've got a far shorter period of time to recognise the climate emergency we face and change our environment for the better. So the government U-turn on air departure tax is a welcome move, welcome move on that journey. But in moving the motion today in my name, Labour recognises that there are other changes that can be made and there is still a long, long way to go and a lot more change is needed. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I remind members, please, to keep to what they've put down on the business bulletin as their amendments and not to drift into other areas, exciting though they may be. I now call on Derek Mackay to speak to move Amendment 17190.1. Cabinet Secretary, five minutes. Uh, to be fair, though, presiding officer, at least Colin Smith has shown that he's agile enough to amend his speech in light of circumstances. Um, we are, we are um, in the midst of a, we are in the midst of a climate emergency. So business as usual will not do, presiding officer. Last week, the Committee on Climate Change published its new report and said that Scotland should set a 2045 target for net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases. So this government has been and will continue to be a world leader on climate change. And as such, we've embraced a new report from the committee in full. We acted immediately with amendments to our bill to set a net zero target for 2045 and increase the targets for 2030 and uh, 2040. Uh, now, in terms of meeting these targets, it won't be easy and it will require difficult decisions to be made. Parliament needs to be prepared for that. And this includes the government's policy on air departure tax. Air departure tax in Scotland had been deferred to ensure it's not devolved in a defective state, something that the UK uh, government uh, admits. So to protect our rural communities, a solution has to be found to the Highlands and Islands exemption before we can take on the tax. The Scottish government will continue to work with the UK government to seek a solution. Now, this government has had a long-standing policy to reduce ADT by 50% and abolish it when resources allow. But in doing so, we've always sought to balance the economic benefits of this policy it could bring it with the impact on the environment. It, the ADT bill itself placed a duty on ministers to consider the economic, environmental and social impacts before setting the rates and bans and to keep this under review. So following the First Minister's declaration of a climate emergency and a new emissions reduction targets for Scotland, we are committed to looking across our whole range of responsibilities and increase action where necessary. It, we have come to the conclusion that the economic benefits that we sought through our ADT policy are not compatible with our new emissions reductions targets. Now, the government hasn't taken this decision lightly, but we have recognised that it is an important first step to meet our tougher climate targets and rise to the climate challenge. So we'll continue to support, of course. Murdo Fraser. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. In light of everything he said, is the Scottish Government still committed to supporting the third runway at Heathrow? As I've just said, the Environment Secretary and other ministers will be looking at the appropriate policy responses in terms of our overall suite of policies. This is a very important and significant first step. Now, I've seen much of the, I've seen much of the pontification from Murdo Fraser in relation to uh, air departure tax or APD. Actually, Colin Smith is right. The position of the Tory manifesto, it was that it wasn't convinced by a reduction in that tax. And the Tories need to be careful what they wish for because the tax cuts plan from the Tories now totals over three quarters of a billion pounds in tax cuts. Right now, if the Tories are so concerned about APD, it's actually the UK government that will continue to set the APD rates in the UK because they've failed to properly devolve it eh, to Scotland. And I do have to say, when the evidence that we've seen leads us to the conclusion that that tax cut is incompatible with our ambitious climate change targets on seeing the evidence that's only the Tories that go in the opposite direction. Now, the, if I have time. Well, just a little, it has to be short. I, I do, thank you. I do recognise that the government wants to look at its wider range of policies, but isn't it clear that if a tax measure to, to boost faster aviation growth is incompatible with climate change policies, then so is any other measure that boosts faster aviation growth. Is the government committed to stabilising aviation levels? Cabinet Secretary. So let me say that aviation emissions do actually account for a relatively small amount of Scotland's overall carbon emissions. We have to look at the suite of policies. So this decision alone will have little impact if it's taken in isolation. So of course we have to look at the range of policies that the government has. But you know, there's a responsibility on everyone in Parliament. If we're serious about the climate emergency, we all need to look at policies and take the appropriate actions to deliver those ambitious 
uh, climate change uh, targets. I actually agree with Colin Smith. There's no point having the targets if we're not putting in place the actions to actually get there. And that's why it will be significant that the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment and Climate Change makes that further statement to Parliament on the challenge required to meet the new targets. So we must take, we must take uh, all appropriate action. And in finance, we are committed to increasing the share of capital expenditure on low carbon projects year on year, ensuring that investment in infrastructure matches our ambition. And as part of the budget agreement with the Greens, local authorities will be empowered to implement uh, workplace parking levies to reduce emissions and encourage that modal shift. So if the Labour Party is serious in their efforts to tackle climate change, if this debate is to be more than just political commentary, then the Labour Party need to be prepared to recognise that their policies and reactions must also change, that difficult decisions are required, and they should now drop their opposition to empowering councils through the workplace parking levy. Tackling the climate emergency requires decisive action, and this government is up for that challenge. I hope that others are too. Please move your amendment. I don't know if you did it at the beginning. Did you move your amendment? I moved the amendment Thank in my you. name. I now call on Jamie Green to speak to move amendment 17190.44 minutes, please, Mr Green. Uh, we want to increase international connectivity and support our thriving tourist industry. So we will use powers coming to the Scottish Parliament to have APD, one of the highest taxes of its kind in the world, and ultimately abolish it. I'm reading that straight from the SNP's own website right this very second in an ironically named section called Scotland Open for Business. So what's changed, presiding officer? Well, this much triumphed and long-awaited reduction to this tax has been canned. A flagship policy which the SNP praised and defended to the hilt, all now frantically looking on social media to delete their tweets. Nicola Sturgeon is trying to walk a political tightrope here, promising support for tourism, aviation, oil, gas and exports in one breath, whilst declaring emergencies in another. Playing hostage to fortune, with policy changes, bereft of intelligent scrutiny, the consequences of which have either been ignored or simply misunderstood. Gordon Dewar of Edinburgh, Gordon Dewar of Edinburgh Airport yesterday put it simply, we've gone from personal commitments to all-out cancellation in two weeks, which shows just how reactionary this decision is. Airports and airlines have been led down a path of failed promises for three years by this government. His angry words not mine. Last night, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, a sensible voice of business, that said yep. some members don't think they're sensible. Well, that's a, a shame. Army, Thank goodness they're not in government. Army, Despite yeah. years of consultation, years, detailed technical and economic valuations, this decision will do nothing to reduce emissions. Instead, it will cut Scotland off at the knees. What credible government proactively does that to the business community? Starting off, so not one that these benches will sit in. In my three years here, never has such a U-turn delivered such a damning indictment. And that's just what it is, a U-turn. A politically motivated, please sit down, a politically motivated and convenient monumental U-turn from this government. It's nothing more than a knee-jerk reaction. It's nothing more than a knee-jerk reaction to a serious and complex problem. It's a decision which flies in the face of its own policy and advice. It's one which does nothing. It's one which does nothing to address the flawed logic at the heart of its rationale. This has not, nor should it ever be, about whether you support the aviation industry or the environment, because we desperately need to support both. Just as we need, as a country, those business travellers who will come and invest here, our tourists who will come and spend their money here. And what is wrong? What is wrong with giving hard-pressed families a helping hand on their well-deserved break, if it's very brief. Yes, this member's in his last minute. No, just move on. Just move uh, I've got a lot to get through. I've got a lot to get through, If you've changed your mind, please sit down. I'm going to move on. I've got a lot to get through in this speech. Presiding officer, it is at best naive. I beg your pardon, please sit down. There seems to be a wee problem here. What's the wee problem? If you take the intervention, I'll Here give you your 30 seconds. It has to be a 30 second intervention. Off you go. Based on what the airlines and the airports have said, just out of curiosity, does Jamie Green think that the UK government should reduce air passenger duty? Jamie Green. Well, the whole, the, 
Dermot Kai knows the whole point of devolution. The whole point of devolution is that this parliament makes the right decisions for Scotland and you've made the wrong decision today. It is simply at best naive and at worst disingenuous to single out any one industry in such an unspecific and uninformed way. No consultation, no, al no analysis and no economic forecasting from the Cabinet Secretary. And what galls people the most is the sheer hypocrisy of all from the SNP. Because they think it's right for people in the Highlands and Islands to be exempt from this tax. They think it's right to back Heathrow expansion. They think it's right to send rockets to space from our peninsula. But in one simple act of ill thought through policy reversal, the SNP has just shown itself up for what it really is. No friend of business and no friend of Scotland's tourism industry. We could have had a sensible, informed and balanced debate today about the future of aviation and the future of our economy. But instead, the First Minister has turned this into a polarised game of political brinkmanship. And the only losers of this game will be Scottish businesses, Scottish jobs and hard-working Scottish families. What a sad U-turn and one which I think this government will live to regret. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And now Colin Patrick Harvey. Four minutes, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've had many opportunities to speak in this chamber against the policy of an aviation tax cut, uh, both before and since the, the theoretical devolution was agreed. The policy has been clearly dead for quite some time now, and I am delighted finally to have the chance to speak in a debate celebrating its ultimate burial. Back as far as 2012, we made the case very clearly. As soon as the Scottish Government had proposed this policy, we made the case very clearly against it, showing not only that it would hurt the, the revenues funding Scottish public services if this was ultimately devolved and then reduced, and challenging the government, which they never responded to, to say where that cost would come from, but also showing at a time when the Scottish government were still carrying on with the delusional nonsense that this would somehow reduce emissions, it was green questions to ministers that forced them ultimately to admit that it would do the opposite and increase emissions from aviation. And we also showed, uh, in working with the campaign group Fellow Travellers, uh, the, the work showing that it would demonstrably benefit the better off. In any one year, the large majority of people in Scotland don't fly at all, and so would gain no benefit from this tax cut. Most of those who do fly, fly once or twice a year, uh, if, uh, of those who do fly in any given year. The vast bulk of this tax cut would go to the tiny number of wealthy, frequent flyers who would disproportionately gain from it. I want to welcome the fact that there has been such movement since that debate, because back in that 2012 debate, we were the only political party making that coherent case, uh, the climate argument against this policy. There were individuals, including Malcolm Chisholm uh, and Willie Rennie, I think, who recognised the strength of the argument that we made, but ultimately it was only myself and Alison Johnson who voted for the Green Amendment on that occasion, and the Labour Party voted with the government on their unamended motion. I welcome the fact that both those parties have changed their views. It's important to recognise that and welcome it. Do you know what? I actually want to welcome how far the Conservative Party have come on this debate as well, because they've made the most extraordinary change in just the space of a week. Yes, last week, presiding officer, they made a wee video for their social media claiming that the Greens have never achieved any environmental change from the SNP uh, in government. And now, this week, with this one policy announcement, they say the SNP have succumbed once again to the environmental extremists. I want to, I want to thank the Conservative Party for recognising the impact that green influence has indeed had. And we can see a lot of that, the positive effects of that green influence in the Scottish Government amendment today. The commitment to shift the balance of the capital budget away from high carbon and toward low is a green policy concession. The commitment to workplace parking levies, originally introduced by Labour, included in Scottish Labour local manifestos in recent years, now opposed by Labour only because it's been introduced by the wrong political party. Presiding officer, 
we must make the longer term case that aviation can't be given a free pass. We all recognize that lifeline flights to the islands, for example, are a special case. But aircraft efficiency alone will not reduce emissions if we keep on flying more. If the whole world flew as much as we do in this country, there would be zero chance of averting climate disaster. So if ADT cuts as a means to boost aviation growth are unacceptable, then so are other methods as well. The Scottish Government must drop its commitment to support Heathrow Third Runway and other means of boosting aviation and commit instead to public transport and to the investment in walking and cycling that would make a real difference to people getting about sustainably in Scotland right Thank across you. our country. Thank you. must conclude and now call Liam MacArthur. Four minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I uh, thank Colin Smith for bringing this debate to Parliament uh, this afternoon. Notwithstanding the Finance Secretary's uh, last-minute U-turn yesterday, I, I can confirm that Scottish Liberal Democrats will be uh, supporting Mr Smith's motion at decision time, not least as this reflects the party's consistently held position on the air departure tax. We will not, however, be supporting either of the amendments. I'm afraid the Tories' position on ADT uh, seems to have been crafted by the same brains trust uh, that brought us Jeremy Corbyn's Brexit position. It risks, therefore, both damaging the environment on the one hand, while also failing uh, to satisfy the airline industry on the other. As for the government's amendment, I'm afraid Mr Mackay, as reasonable um, as he ever is, uh, cannot get away with rewriting history. He's right. Cutting and, abol or, and abolishing ADT is certainly not compatible with the more ambitious climate change targets we wish to set. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, it wasn't compatible with the previous climate change targets either. The truth is, this policy has never been compatible with... I'm sorry, no. It's never been compatible with our climate change ambitions, and no amount of resetting the clock by Mr Mackay and all of the other ministers lined up as supporters to his amendment will persuade this chamber or the public otherwise. The justification for giving the airline industry a £250 million tax break was always dubious. Against the backdrop of rising passenger numbers and an expanding network of routes, the SNP's decision to offer such a massive windfall looked reckless. So what was the evidence for this move? Well, therein lies a tale. I note that Keith Brown is not amongst those uh, listed as a supporter of the government's new position. That's a shame, for it was he uh, who, when asked uh, in a written question back in 2013 what the evidence was for the policy, pointed my colleague Willie Rennie in the direction of the EasyJet website. Helpfully, there to be found was a report commissioned by British Airways, EasyJet, Virgin Atlantic and Ryanair. Surprisingly, they thought a £250 million tax cut to the airline industry was all upside. Who knew? Massive economic benefits, little environmental impact. Too good to be true, surely. Clearly, even SNP ministers thought so, as an independent expert group was then consulted. Sadly, this group comprised 15 airline and airport representatives and one lone environmental voice. SNP ministers seemed determined to stack the dice. By contrast, when the government went out to public consultation on their proposals, half the respondents raised concerns or objections principally around the environmental impact. The other main concern, of course, was the impact the tax giveaway would have on funding available for key public services, education, health, policing, even support to help decarbonise our transport system. The audacious attempt to raid the Scottish Government's own coffers cannot be laid at the feet of Westminster, however. The move had the SNP's fingerprints all over it. Even with yesterday's U-turn, the First Minister needs to explain how her full-throated support for a third runway at Heathrow squares with her newfound acceptance of this climate emergency. Deputy Presiding Officer, I accept we need an airline industry in good health. Given the constituency I represent, how could I do otherwise? And there is a strong case for reducing taxes and costs on certain types of air service where these provide a lifeline, usually a pretty expensive lifeline, I may add, for remote rural and island communities. But there is a world of difference between that sort of targeted intervention and the sort of windfall previously being offered up by the SNP and still now being backed by the Tories. I welcome the government's decision to abandon this reckless policy, however belatedly, and reiterate my support for the motion in Colin Smith's name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate. Speeches of four minutes, no time in hand. Claudia Beamish, followed by Julian Martin. Uh, thank you, Deputy Residing Officer. Last week was a truly significant time for this Parliament and the country. 
as the Scottish Government agreed to up its ambition and shift its long-term emissions reductions in line with the UK Committee on Climate Change advice. Net zero by 2045 is indeed world-leading, feasible, cost-effective and necessary. Scottish Labour has led the way on this along with others. And so I'm delighted that the pressure from Scottish Labour has led to the Scottish Government changing its mind on the cutting of air departure tax, a money saver for the wealthy that, could, uh, that would have had been the equivalent of 30,000 new cars on the road. It was always a regressive tax and it is welcome that the Cabinet Secretary has come to recognise its social and environmental implications. Of course, this necessity for swift climate action has been stark since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on 1.5. The damage at 2 degrees centigrade rise would be far-reaching, turning dangerous extremes into an almost normality. Disaster for so many, though. 1.5 is an imperative for the global population's health, livelihoods, food, peace and safety and for the continuation of our natural world as we know, love and rely upon. These issues are intersectional with class, race and gender and many other characteristics. I will focus briefly on race after having chaired a conference at, on climate justice at UN House in which Black Lives Matter spoke. Communities in the Global South are adapting to climate change now, and uh, uh, seven out of 10 of the countries most vulnerable to it, its effects are in Sub-Saharan Africa. But these issues are here at home too. Black British Africans are 29% more likely than white counterparts parts to be exposed to air pollution. The Black Lives Matter protest at London City Airport highlighted the climate injustice of an airport for the elite polluting in a low-income London community and exacerbating climate change, indeed, for the global south as well. Alterations to ADT would have included cuts to short-haul flights, for which there are rail alternatives, including to the continent via Eurostar. This would have been likely to have a significant impact on the rail sector. For example, a greater number of choice of, uh, of choices in short-haul flights at a lower price could displace some rail movements. This is the opposite of the modal shift that the Scottish Government needs to encourage in order to deliver a sustainable transport system. And Scottish Labour can suggest a number of other ways to demonstrate the, uh, and, and act on the, this modal shift. We would stop the cuts to councils that are devastating the public transport links and active travel schemes. We need more on-road segregated cycle schemes. We would introduce a young person's bus pass to encourage a long-term modal shift, strengthen legislation on LEZs, and promote public ownership so that profits can be spent improving services, lowering fares, and delivering greener vehicles. The UK CCC report emphasised how vital good how vital good policy design will be in reaching net zero. We as parliamentarians must now apply stricter tests on all policies with due regard to its environmental and social externalities. And considerations like these will elevate Scotland to the progressive place we want it to be. This is a challenging and exciting time and the government has made two welcome shifts from its original policies lately. All parties must scrutinise their policies as we go forward towards net zero emissions. This mentality should be rolled out across all sectors to give stable, long-term direction. Close, and I look forward to the government's review of all policies in, in the new climate change plan and to contributing to this. This is indeed a climate emergency. We must act together. I say to members, we're already over time and speeches will get cut if uh, people insist on doing that. Gillian Martin, followed by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. This is an interesting motion from Labour, and I'd like to talk about each part of it in turn. But before I do, I want to recognise my committee colleague, Claudia Beamish, as being a robust challenger of policy and a strong influencer within our own party, which I think shows. So the, the first line of the motion asks the Scottish Government to review its policies in response to the global climate emergency. And in FMQs last week, the First Minister said that she would review all policy areas with regard to increased ambition to tackle climate change. And just over an hour ago, the First Minister responded positively directly to me on a question on how all Cabinet Secretaries will take ownership uh, of the Government's commitment on action in reaching the net zero target. 
And of course, this comes off the back of the government accepting the main recommendations of the Environment, uh, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's report on the Climate Change Bill, um, which includes accepting the advice of the UK Committee on Climate Change and producing a new climate change plan uh, within six months of royal assent. It's interesting to note that in the middle of the motion, Labour called for local authorities to be more empowered to tackle climate change. And of course, we do have a recent example of, uh, of where the government has done just that in the, giving local authorities the power to uh, introduce a car parking levy, um, a power that I think maybe only local authorities and cities with good public infra uh, transport infrastructure, infrastructure will see fit to use. Rural councils like mine have opted not to use it, given that for Aberdeenshire we do not yet have the public transport infrastructure uh, that means that people can completely ditch their cars. And, and I agree with that decision. It's exactly why this uh, kind of decision has to be made at local level. Yet here's the weird thing. After the government decided to give local authorities that power, that discretionary power, James Kelly was out and about campaigning against it. Uh, quite against the, the views of his own colleagues, Cammy Day, uh, Councillor Cammy Day, heads at the Labour Group in Edinburgh City Council, disagreed with them and argued, he said, we've argued that councils need powers like the tourist tax and the workplace parking levy. Um, to, to, to be able to uh, not tax cars, he said, but create a new environment for people to work, live and enjoy the city. Um, but finally, let's look at the motion's main title, Scotland's Future. Well, as we wait for a UK government's response to the advice on targets from the UK Committee on Climate Change and wait and wait, we're met with a wall of silence in the policies the Tory government are going to pursue to meet their advised targets. And I'm yet more convinced that Scotland's future has to be won as an independent country, which has all the levers available to it to make agile and meaningful Excuse decisions. Excuse me, Ms. Martin. Like the ones that they have just Excuse made Excuse me, APD. Ms. Martin. Um, could up members, this is not the first contribution this has happened in, could members please make sure that they use their time to address the motion and amendments under discussion? And I'm, just, I'm just actually coming to, to the air departure tax uh, part of this. The, 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 one, the, the, the levers available to it to make agile and meaningful decisions like the one that they have made on APD, which was decided in the first cabinet meeting after the CCC's advice was received, and I note also uh, today's announcement on DRS. Now, Scotland's already got a reputation for being a world leader in tackling climate change with the power they already have at their disposal. Um, and, and this uh, decision this week is, is, is proof of that agile working. I also asked the First Minister about the importance of the UK government also committing to targets in the CCC the advice they set. She pointed out three areas that specifically been asked to address. Those are decarbonisation of the gas network, commitment to invest in carbon capture and storage technology, and an earlier date in the electrification of cars, potentially in line with the Scottish Government's date of 2032. I mean, the motion suggests that Labour's fully on board with supporting these areas of devolved and local authority powers that they previously didn't. You have to close forward. now, please, Ms. Martin. I'll close. John Scott, followed by John Mace. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by expressing an interest as a co-convener of the cross-party group in aviation and my surprise at being here today debating the SNP government's U-turn on yet another of its flagship policies. Not only am I concerned about the SNP government again going back on its word freely given, but it is no exaggeration to say the business leaders from across Scotland are queuing up yep. to condemn this anti-business, anti-tourism, anti-people SNP government. Yep. Because the people in their constituency, presiding officer, will not understand why the Scottish government owners of Prestwick Airport just made it even more difficult to fly airplanes to and from this remarkable and strategically placed airport. My constituents will not forgive the broken promises made by this SNP government to do all they could to help Prestwick Airport grow and succeed because air departure tax most adversely affects regional airports such as Prestwick, Aberdeen yeah. and Dundee. Instead, the 300 or so trusted and valued employees at Prestwick Airport will be wondering today for how long will they have a job at all given Ryanair's anger at this broken promise, which of course affects all their flights to and from Scotland, not just Prestwick. Presiding officer, I was in Dublin on the day in April 2014, Michael O'Leary announced he had persuaded the Irish government to abolish APD, saying he would increase the Irish government's tax take from tourism through increased VAT receipts 
if they would abolish APD, and presiding officer Michael O'Leary did just that, increasing tourists visiting Ireland by 3.3 million people in the first year that the APD was abolished in Ireland. Indeed, at that time, Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay was so impressed that he told the Daily Record that more investment would be possible if APD was to be scrapped in Scotland. Consistency there, Cabinet Secretary. What? So today, we witness the SNP again dividing Scotland into those who are for Scotland's business development, and the SNP supported, it appears, by the Labour Party and now the Liberals as well, who are against business development. But don't take my word for it, Cabinet Secretary. But No, I will not. But do listen, if you will, to the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, who have roundly condemned the SNP government for going back on its word. Do listen to Gordon Dewar of Edinburgh Airport, Scotland's most successful airport, who said, this decision does not show leadership and means airports and airlines have been led down a path of failed promises for three years by this Scottish government. So, today the SNP government have shown again that they do not keep their promises. Instead, they make promises to win elections and then go back on them. Yeah. My constituents in Ayrshire and others in Aberdeenshire and Dundee will be outraged by yet another failure to deliver by the Scottish government as their business connections and holiday destination choices just got harder and more expensive to make because of the actions of their government. Of course. We all know the threat of climate change needs to be addressed, but this virtue signalling by the Scottish Government is not the way to go about it, yeah. as Could the aviation stop shouting industry it, Mr. Scott, is already clearing up its act more quickly than almost any other industry on greenhouse gas emissions. Instead, the Government is allowing itself to be driven by the Green Party agenda in a similar way to the proposed imposition of a workplace car parking charging scheme. And the SNP and the Greens will pay the price at the ballot box as they displace jobs, tourism from Scotland at the same time as reducing the choice of easily accessible tourist destinations from Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you. John Mason followed by Alex Rowley. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. It seems to me that this has always been one of those issues where there was a fairly fine balance between seeking to boost our tourism sector on the one hand with a lower air departure tax, which would hopefully have encouraged visitors to come to Scotland, but on the other hand, we want to tackle climate change and protect the environment, so that we lean towards discouraging flying as a means of travel at, by keeping or even raising taxes like ADT. There is also, I think, let me go a little bit longer. There is also the factor that at a time of very tight finances, if we want better public services, we need to raise tax and certainly not cut it, whereas cutting tax remains, means further restrictions on spending, as the Conservative Party very well knows. The reality is that we should all be taking climate change more seriously than we may have done in the past. We cannot stick rigidly to policies that seemed right in the past, and I think it is the sign of a mature parliament and mature government that we can learn and adapt to circumstances. I think other parties need to consider their positions as well, the aim of the workplace and maybe other places parking levy is to discourage the use of cars and get more people using public transport. Again, there is a balance to be struck. People want to use their cars and we are a democracy. So we can only restrict car use to the extent that the public will accept. However, no, not from uh, Mr. Kerr, no, if he's going to be cheeky. Uh, however, <laughs> That is not to say there should be no change in the way things have been done in the past. We in the SNP seem to find ourselves in the middle ground on a number of these issues. We have the Greens, who I admire for their idealism, wanting to go much further than the public is prepared for. And on the other hand, we see Labour and the Tories opposing the likes of a workplace parking levy, presumably because it comes from the SNP and Greens. Mr Harvey, briefly. I, oh, Patrick Harvey. I'm, I'm grateful. Does uh, Mr Mason not think that the wave of new direct action and activism from the school strikers to Extinction Rebellion demonstrates that actually the public are rather ready for us to go further than many politicians have previously thought possible. John Mason. Yes, I think that is correct, and the, the public mood is changing, but they're not ready to have cars abolished tomorrow night, as I think some of his colleagues might want. Now, there has been some fairly extreme comment on this decision, eh, not least from the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. They do say we need balance and we need to reach a balanced judgment. 
But they also say this will, quote, cut Scotland off at the knees, unquote. Now, this is clearly nonsense, and I would expect something better from the Chambers of Commerce. Both our tourism sector and the increase in flight destinations from Scotland are doing well, perhaps better than we had expected when the policy to cut ADT was introduced. And there are many other factors affecting numbers of flights and passengers apart from just this tax. One example is that Manchester Airport draws on a larger population base than we do. Can I also say that I have some sympathy for the Green Amendment, which was not chosen for debate today. Expansion at Heathrow might give more onward flights for travellers from Scotland, but it could also undermine the aim to get more direct flights to Scotland. And on top of that, it is likely to have a negative effect on the environment. So if recent developments uh, mean we are re-examining previous decisions, perhaps Heathrow is another policy that does need to be re-examined. Finally, I do note in the Conservative amendment, as has been mentioned, ma uh, mention of manifesto commitments. I think their 2016 manifesto said they would not support an APD cut. One of the strengths of this parliament is no party has a majority and every party needs to compromise and find common ground. As an SNP MSP, I find that disappointing at times, but as a Democrat and a parliamentarian, I find that extremely good. In, a, an ability to adapt, compromise and negotiate is is a good thing. We do not see that with Theresa May at Westminster, but I hope it's something we do see at Holyrood. Thank you. Alex Rowley, followed by Jamie Halker Jones. The presiding officer, the estimates put on the air departure tax being cut by 50% was £150 million. Pounds. And if you take that to the, the conclusion that the Conservatives would like to go, that's £300 million. Pounds. And the question has got to be asked, where would that money have come from? Where would those cuts have taken place in public services? And the credibility of the Conservative Party to come in here and shout about that when we know their budget cuts would have taken our five, six hundred million 600 million pounds out of public services in Scotland surely leaves them with no credibility whatsoever. So for whatever reasons the government have uh, brought about this, this U-turn in policy, it's got to be one that's welcomed. And we've got to recognise that as we address the climate crisis in this country, that we have to do so in a fair and equitable way. Indeed, a transition to a zero carbon economy must be part, surely, of a broader programme for redistributing wealth and power in this country. I would want to quote from Rebecca Long-Bailey, Labour's uh, business secretary at a UK level, and she pointed out that Britain is already one of the most unequal and regionally divided countries in Europe. Poorly implemented economic transitions threaten to further impoverish the poorest parts of the country that are already suffering the worst effects of deindustrialisation and austerity. If climate policy does not fundamentally address these problems, it, on, it not only risks accelerating them, but it will never receive mass support of British working people. And that surely has to be a key objective of every political party in here, that we build mass support across the country for tackling the climate crisis. And that's why I would turn to the SNP and say to them that, yes, of course, we should be working together to tackle the climate crisis, but we will not line up to support half-baked policy that has not been thought through. And if you take the supposed workplace parking levy, that is, in my view, a half-baked policy that has not been thought through and would attack working people, indeed threaten their very jobs. Where, where, for example, in Babcock and Resyth, where workers travel for all over Fife, where there is not a good public transport system in place. Diageo, uh, Diageo. Point of order from Jamie Green. Uh, sorry, also, this has got nothing to do with the motion, not a single mention of APD. Mr. Gr excuse me, uh, excuse me, could I have some silence, please? Mr. Green, that's for me to decide, not for you to decide. Okay, Mr. Rowley. Yeah, and if you read the amendment for the for the, the SNP, it's got absolutely everything to do with the motion and the amendment. But 
workers, workers in Diageo, travelling, travelling for all over Fife and much further afield in Mid Scotland and Fife, indeed, having to then end up paying a workplace parking levy. So it is not thought through properly, and it's a policy that, Rowley, that, that, so that would, would hurt workers. And can I just because we're coming to the end of this, can I say that I have looked at Nottingham, where they have brought in this workplace parking levy, and the levels of emissions in Nottingham city centre have not been drastically cut as a result of this policy. So I welcome the decision by the government to, to back down please. on this. Let's work together, but let's ensure that we work together to come up with the right policies close, please, for Rowley. Scotland. Jamie Halker Johnson, followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Planned reductions to air departure tax have been in the pipeline for several years now. These were long standing commitments by the Scottish Government. They were a flagship transport policy, one that gave some reassurance to Scotland's business community that the SNP had an interest in and some understanding of our country's economy and in creating a more global Scotland. And as a member of the Highlands and Islands and a Orcadian, I've seen firsthand the benefits of the APD exemption and the wider positive impact on the region. It has been crucial to the growth of services in and around my region, a region where flights, even those serving the Isles, can be prohibitively expensive. But while the Highlands and Islands exemption is crucially important, it is not enough in itself. As fellow Highland MSP Kate Forbes herself observed as the ADT bill was progressing, its natural reduction promised to have a direct and positive impact on families in the Highlands. Does Kate Forbes, as a minister, believe this now not to be true? any longer. And if we accept the importance of our regional uh, exemption, why would we assume that those same benefits would not accrue significantly, significantly from a re national reduction? It is frankly, I'm just going to move on please, it is frankly ridiculous that the Scottish Government are now ignoring the benefits of effective affordable connectivity after so many years of making the case for it. And what is of greater concern is this, if the SNP are now targeting air travel to meet climate goals, how long will that Highlands and Islands exemption itself remain? And like reductions in ADT, the SNP has long promised a settled reduction in ferry fares on the Northern, Isle, Northern Isles routes. And this still hasn't been delivered yet either. Mr Mackay, for, please sit down. I would ask for assurances from the Scottish Government in their summing up that the Highlands and Islands exemption isn't under threat and that they are still committed to reducing ferry fares on the Northern Isles routes. But as we've heard already, from the aviation sector, sector who were given assurances only a couple of weeks ago and yesterday learned that those assurances meant nothing. Yeah. Looking yesterday like a man sent out to deliver news he doesn't really agree with, the Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay desperately tried to shift blame for his government's failure onto the UK government. But had these reductions been delivered two years ago, does Derek Mackay really have us believe that yesterday he would have reintroduced full ADT? Yeah. I will if you're going to answer that question. First of all, Derek Mackay. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the member for taking the intervention. The reason that we haven't taken on devolution of APD is to protect the Highlands and Islands exemption, so the Highlands and Islands exemption is absolutely here to stay. Uh, but specifically in relation to what's changed, should we all not reflect upon the advice from the Committee on Climate Change, which has said, unlike the previous position where they said it was manageable in terms of emissions, that right now it makes our job easier in terms of meeting those ambitious climate change targets. Should we not respond in light of that kind of information? Jamie Halker johnson I'll take you to four and a half minutes. Well, I thought it, the reasons were climate change, as you've repeatedly stated, but okay. Um, a policy fully reversed in just two weeks. So it, is this a genuine climate change focus move by the SNP? Is the Nicola Copter permanently grounded? It's days of ferrying the First Minister between party engagements finally over? Probably not, because this isn't about climate page change. It's all about political gamesmanship. Headline-grabbing hypocrisy from a government which still rightly backs our oil and gas sector and still rightly, well probably, backs expansion of Heathrow Airport. And I would also ask another question which perhaps the government could address in their summing up. Given this U-turn will seriously impact on businesses across Scotland, most notably within the aviation sector, and given the Scottish Government themselves own a number of airports, can the Cabinet Secretary or Minister confirm that the correct procedures for releasing commercially sensitive information have been followed and that neither High Isle nor Prestwick Airport were given any advance notice of this decision? Presiding Officer, ADT is not an effective tax against climate change. It's a tax on Scotland's links to the world. 
The Finance Secretary once spoke about an ADT reduction boosting trade, investment, influence and networks for Scotland. The Scottish Government spent many years as evangelists for Scotland's connectivity. But now the strategic assets of air travel in Scotland have suddenly become reg regrettable polluters to SNP eyes. Where does this leave their transport policies? And at what price does Scotland's connectivity and its economy? The last of the open debate contributions is from James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. There can be no doubt Scotland's a world leader in tackling climate change. The government has ensured fracking, in addition to under coal, underground coal gasification, will have no place in Scotland's energy mix. We've already halved greenhouse gas emissions whilst growing the economy. And following yesterday's announcement, we've listened to the evidence and decided not to proceed with plans to cut air departure tax. This will have seen, been a difficult decision for the government. However, it shows the SNP are taking the climate emergency seriously, far more seriously, it appears, than other parties. It's a, presiding officer, global climate change is one of those defining issues of our time, and we are now at a defining moment in it. And I sincerely hope that all parties are prepared to rise to the challenge, a challenge brilliantly laid down by our younger generations, drop the knee-jerk opposition that may suit short-term politics and unite behind doing what is right for the future of our planet. It's a challenge that so far, the Tories, Labour and Liberal Democrats have shown little inclination that they plan to meet. We've discussed the, working, the workplace parking levy a few times today, but they are, under a Tory government, councils in England already have the powers to introduce such a levy, a levy which would support the Scottish Government's ambition to reduce emissions. Yet the Scottish Tories are steadfast in their opposition. It's a policy which was introduced by Labour in England, implemented by a Labour councillor in Nottingham, a Labour councillor in Nottingham, supported by Glasgow and Edinburgh Council candidates in 2017, and reportedly backed by Claudia Beamish, Labour spokesperson for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Yet Scottish Labour are steadfast in their opposition. And when provisions for a workplace parking levy were introduced by the Labour Party and the UK's Transport Act 2000, these measures were supported by Liberal Democrat members of the UK Parliament. Yet the Scottish Lib, Lib Dems are steadfast in their opposition. And despite what Alec Rowley says, this is a policy which, according to Nottingham City Council's portfolio holder for transport, has helped improve air quality and has contributed to falling nitrogen dioxide emissions, largely due to the investment in sustainable public transport made possible with levy funding. The opposition parties really must stop playing political games on issue and listen to the evidence. Secondly, we've got Labour, Liberal Democrats and Tory support for the nuclear weapons programme. We all know the Tories are unashamedly Excuse obsessed. Excuse me, Mr Dornan. Excuse me, Mr Dornan. Do you think you could come back to addressing the motion? The, the, Thank the you. motion is surely about climate change as well as a ADT. Sorry, Mr Dornan. Surely the, the motion is about the climate change and the impact ADT is going to have on it along with other things. Mr Dornan, I'm not asking you to argue with me. I'm just asking you to address the motion. I just want to know how You have a minute and a half left. Right, OK. Uh, it appears that uh, the fact that, that some of the parties are quite happy to endanger the climate in some ways but make a fuss about the air passenger duty is uh, OK. But I would say that meeting our climate change targets will mean that we have to up our ambitions across a whole range of government responsibilities. And this decision shows that the SNP government has listened and already taken decisive action. It's now time for the other parties to show they are also willing to listen to the evidence and act. The opposition parties must refrain from simply opposing everything tough or challenging, such as a workplace parking levy, and step up to the plate. All sides of this chamber have to accept that positions may need to change in light of the climate emergency. It cannot simply be left down to the Scottish Government. Every single one of us now needs to take more action. Individuals, businesses, schools, communities, organisations, the Scottish Government and the UK Government. So let's work together and make that change. Presiding officer, there's still time to stop climate change. So let's put aside the party politics for once to help ensure we can save the planet for our future generations to enjoy. It doesn't look like I'm going to have a very good support for that and among the opposition. We now move to the closing speeches. Murdo Fraser, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, this has been a, a significant debate for what it tells us about the cack-handed policymaking within the SNP government. These are the people who told us for years about the priority of cutting air departure tax. In 2016, they said this, we'll half the overall level of APD to support growth and improve connections across the globe. Every time we have a debate in this chamber on tourism or connectivity or exporting, they tell us how important this policy is, and now they've 
ditched it. And I remember doing hustings before the last Scottish election with Fergus Ewing, then uh, speaking uh, on tourism, promising the tourism sector how this important policy would be delivered. Only two weeks ago, apparently, the, the Minister Kate Forbes was assuring Gordon Dewar at Edinburgh Airport with a personal commitment that this policy would be maintained and now it's all been abandoned and all these people have been hung out to dry. And we've seen the reaction from, not, not just now, and we've seen the reaction from the business community quoted uh, by John Scott. Uh, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce saying this change in policy will cut Scotland off at the knees in terms of connectivity and their competitive playing field. And it just shows, I think, the contrast between the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP under her predecessor, Alex Salmon. Because at least Mr Salmon understood business in Scotland. At least he stood up for cuts in corporation tax and cuts in ADT. The whole pro-business legacy of the SNP has been trashed under uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Derek Mackay. And it's no wonder business is turning away from the SNP and turning to the Conservatives. Because we understand, no thank you, we understand what this is an important issue for connectivity, as Jamie Green said. They keep telling us they want more powers to grow the economy, but when they get those powers, they either hand them back, Deputy Presiding Officer, or they don't use them at all, as in this case. Now, a number of speakers in this debate have quite properly raised the issue of climate change. And it's pre precisely because of the concerns we had around climate change that our policy on ADT reduction was different from the Scottish Government's policy. We did not support a cut in ADT for domestic or short-term flights, precisely because we were concerned that this would lead to surface travel being less competitive than air travel. And that's why the ADT cut we proposed would apply only to long-haul routes where there was no surface alternative or where at present people are having to make extra journeys with connecting flights rather than one journey straight into Scotland. And what cutting long haul would do is open Scotland to the world, bringing in the, in the opportunity of new routes to places like North and Central America and Asia, which can only be to our economic benefit. And it's this economic benefit which will deliver increases in additional tax revenues elsewhere. No, thank you. With increased, increased taxation coming from income tax through growing employment, additional VAT through spending. Indeed, John Scott pointed out that the experience in Ireland shows you can grow your tax revenues by cutting ADT. And Alex Riley should look, and look at that uh, experience. But it's the position of the Labour Party uh, this afternoon that does cause me some concern. Because what the Labour Party seem to be saying is that air travel should once again become the preserve of the rich and not be available to ordinary working people. Because it's only in comparatively recent times over the last three decades, the air travel has become affordable for ordinary families. The first time I was on a plane was when I was 21, and that was not unusual for people of my generation. Many Scottish families didn't have overseas holidays until well into the 1980s or 1990s. And now the Labour Party in Scotland, no thank you, the supposed Mr. party Fraser's of the working closing. class now seem to be saying that ordinary working families across Scotland should no longer have that opportunity. They seem to be saying you have only to the close, rich please. should be able to afford to fly on overseas holidays. What a strange place close, for the supposed party of the workers to find themselves in. Presiding officer, shame on Labour you and must shame close, on the SNP please. for tearing up their policy. Rosanna Cunningham, four minutes, please. There is a climate emergency. The Scottish Government is acting accordingly and our first step was to immediately lodge amendments to our climate change bill to set a net zero emissions target for 2045 in response to last week's report from the Committee on Climate Change. Our next step is looking at the concrete actions that need to be taken as a result. Unlike the Tories, we know that difficult decisions are required and we are taking this seriously. Yesterday's announcement on air departure tax makes that clear. Scotland has already shown leadership on this issue as the first country in the world to include a fair share of emissions from international aviation in our climate targets. Our whole economy approach is working, with emissions almost halved since 1990. Aviation currently represents less than 5% of Scotland's total annual emissions, but this is growing, and even relatively small levels of emissions can be important when targets are very ambitious, as they are now. Scotland's current climate targets are already world-leading, but we know that greater action is required. We are listening, and it is in this context that the Scottish Government has decided that reducing air departure tax 
is no longer compatible with more ambitious climate targets. And in answer to some of the questions raised, members should be aware that in 2017, CCC advised that a 50% reduction in ADT was likely to be manageable in terms of emissions impact. This year, the Chief Executive said that a change in policy on ADT would help immensely with the emissions challenge. To be clear, we are still fully committed to taking on ADT once the solution to the Highlands and Islands exemption issue has been resolved. But in support of our climate change targets, we no longer plan to reduce the tax. And I would emphasise that aviation is only one part of the emissions picture. Meeting Scotland's climate targets will require many difficult decisions across all areas of the economy and society. And Parliament needs to be prepared for that. The UK Committee on Climate Change have been stark in saying that their proposed new targets will require extensive changes across the economy. Our announcement yesterday, along with our commitment to increase the share of capital expenditure on low carbon projects year on year, demonstrates that we are prepared to lead the way on those difficult decisions. The time for action is now. It is not the time for short-term political point scoring, and I hope that proposals that will help us to reach our climate change goals, such as the workplace parking levy and low emission zones, will be supported. The Scottish Government has committed to updating the climate change plan within six months of the bill receiving royal assent. And that means we will look across our whole range of responsibilities, all our policies, to make sure we continue with the policies that are working and increase action where that is necessary. And I hope all parties in this chamber will approach it in that same way. The next step will be in the summer. We will engage the public, communities, businesses, industry and the public sector in a discussion about what more can be done to address climate change. We also need to discuss where further UK government action is needed. The Committee on Climate Change have been clear that the delivery of net zero emissions in Scotland depends on increased UK government action across policy areas that are, remain reserved. In summary, the Scottish Government is committed to doing what is needed to limit global temperature rises as we promised in our manifesto yep. and will not shy away from those difficult decisions. Colin James Kelly to close the debate. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been a very interesting couple of days watching the political gymnastics of SNP, uh, SNP ministers. Um, because for three years, we've, we've watched the SNP front bench uh, doggedly defend this policy of passing tax cuts to airlines and imposing cuts on public services. Uh, and I'm glad that Labour table in this debate today has precipitated a change in the policy. It's a, it, it is the right move. As Colin Smith pointed out, in terms of uh, tackling an objective of net zero emissions, having in place a policy of uh, reducing ADT by 50% would result in 60,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions a year, uh, which is contrary to uh, a, a policy of uh, an ambition of uh, achieving uh, climate change targets. I think the other point is that uh, it's a, it was an unfair policy in that it sought to uh, pass tax cuts to uh, airports uh, and also to frequent flyers to those who were better off. What I would say in response to Murdo Fraser is I would point out that nearly half of the Scottish public uh, can't afford to travel by air. They can't. They don't, they, they don't get anywhere near an airport. Uh, some of them can't even afford a holiday. So why should we design our policy to give tax cuts to frequent uh, airport flyers? I think the other point that was made effectively by Alec Rowley was the effect on the Scottish budget, because it would lead to a reduction in that budget, first of all, by £150 million in terms of the 50% reduction, and £300 million if there was a full reduction. And uh, it was also based on, you know, as Liam MacArthur pointed out, uh, a, a lack of evidence. You know, some of the evidence was written by the airlines themselves. 
Uh, and you'd have to ask the question, if you're, no, I don't want to take the intervention. You'd have to ask the question, if you're going to take £150 million out of the Scottish budget, uh, that could be £150 million pounds more out of council budgets, which are already been constrained and cut. And that would affect people across the country. That would affect local commu communities and local economies. I'll take the intervention. Derek Mackay. Uh, could I ask uh, Mr Kelly directly, the information that we've received, the, uh, the climate change targets that we've all signed up to give us cause to look at our policies. Is the Labour Party looking at their own policies in relation to climate change, yes or no? James Kelly. Of course we're examining all our policies and in response to that, as, as Claudia Beamish said, uh, what we need is a sustainable transport policy. We'll so we need, we need a policy that looks across all areas. So that should start with rail. So we're, we need, therefore, uh, an operator that's going to uh, give confidence to rail passengers that trains are going to turn up in time. And we could also, we could also do with using some of that £150 million that was been proposed as a cut. We're using a million pounds of it to save the jobs at the Cali Rail Depot and keep the, keep the jobs in Scotland. I think also we need to look at the transport bill. I think that, as it's drafted currently, is a, a missed opportunity. There's too much power in the hands of the bus operators who strip away and cut away routes from local communities. We see, we see bus fares increasing by 11% uh, in real terms over the last five years, whereas wages in this country uh, have reduced in real terms by 1.5% uh, since 2009. And I think also uh, Alec Rowley was, made a very relevant point on the workplace parking levy. We're not going to support regressive policies uh, which mean low-paid workers paying more tax there are 480,000 workers in Scotland no, not being, not being paid the real living wage. And we will not support a policy that means they've got to pay more out of their, their, their small and paltry wage packets and make it more difficult uh, for them to sustain and support their families. And summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a welcome U-turn from the government. But we also need to look at other areas of transport policy to tackle low emissions. We need a proper rail service and we need a transport bill that gives more power to communities and takes power away from bus operators. That concludes the debate on Scotland's future. Scrap the cut to the air departure tax. And it's time to move on to the next item of business. If you could sort yourselves out, please.